and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and well, first off, I know I said in my monthly wrap up that would be the last video I'd be filming for a while. That is clearly not the case. Basically, I'm on a wait list to go to a clinic, the hospital. Let's leave it at that. And I have videos scheduled for the coming weeks. Basically, pretend that time doesn't exist in the videos I made for the second half of the month of November and the month of December and probably the first half of the month of January because you'll get different mentions of time and me being at home or not being at home taking a leave of absence. So if you're confused, that's normal. Right, now that that's out of the way, welcome back. So yeah, I'm still at home and I finished God Emperor of Doom and I have a lot of thoughts about it. So this is going to be kind of a review for God Emperor of Dune by Frank Herbert. I say kind of because I haven't really prepared my usual note cards for doing book reviews. I just have like this sheet of paper with stuff written on it. And I had only originally planned to do a review for the first Dune book and then a series review. You will have a series review for the Duneverse, but that won't be coming until probably mid-January, unfortunately. So in the meantime, have something to um, help you transition over. It'll be a kind of review, a kind of ranch review, I should add, for God Emperor of Dune. I'm gonna be probably a bit more all over the place than usual, a bit rambly. I'm also quite tired, so please bear with me and uh, settle down with a warm beverage or a good glass of water. And yeah, let's get into it. So I went into God Emperor of Dune already kind of knowing what it was going to be like. I had read that it was fairly different in structure and format from the original Dune trilogy. I also learned through the introduction by Brian Herbert that the way Frank Herbert conceptualized his Dune saga was a first relatively self-contained trilogy a second relatively self-contained trilogy, which he never completed. So there are only two books in that planned trilogy, Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune. And so God Emperor of Dune was supposed to be like the linking book between these two trilogies. So if I had to give like an acronym to represent God Emperor of Dune, it would be WTF. If I had to give a single word to uh, encompass God Emperor of Dune, it would be why. Just why. To me, this kind of jumped over a cliff. And okay, so before I get into the meat of it, be forewarned, I'm going to be spoiling the crap out of this bitch. For one thing, the only people who will probably be interested in this weird rambly rant review are people, I presume, who've already read the first three Doom books. But second, okay, fine, if you're just here to know whether it's worth your time or not, in my personal opinion, skip this one. I did not like it. Apparently you can actually kind of skip it and just go straight to Heretics of Dune and still understand the story and enjoy, hopefully, the story. So if you're just here to have that stamp of approval or not, I can already tell you I'm not giving my stamp of approval in any case. If you actually care, if anyone cares about it, I would not recommend God Emperor of Doom. You can go now if you want, because from now on, I'm going to be spoiling the crap out of this. So I said it kind of jumped off the cliff, which is freaking hilarious because good old Dito the second kind of fall off, well, a bridge, not a cliff. And why was I happy for him to finally croak? Just freaking die already. And it's even more so hilarious because one of the characters, Siona Trades, is kind of talking to Leto as he's disintegrating into a puddle of spice essence, blood, and bone foam. Why isn't he dead already? I was asking myself the exact same question. Just freaking die already. So I guess I could talk about the writing. I will say this. I think Frank Herbert's writing has slightly improved over the three Dune books. Like the thing with the R's that went on for seven letters and things like that, that kind of went away, thankfully. But this book is mostly dialogue, which is a very jarring transition. I don't mind it so much in and of itself. It can work, but it's super freaking different from the first three books. It's completely different. It's mostly dialogue. And I would argue one-sided dialogues about 
because it's mostly the God Emperor Leto II, so Paul Muad'Dib's son, pontificating, philosophizing on oh shit for 10 pages at a time. It gets very tiring very quickly, more so because it's freaking redundant at this point. It's basically recycling stuff on politics and religion, which you already kind of get in the first Dune trilogy. And what's worse is that some of the stuff he says contradicts what you get in the original Dune trilogy. So Frank Herbert, may you rest in peace. I don't really know what you were going for there, mate. This is gonna sound so mean and petty. Again, please bear in mind, I never bear any ill will to any of the authors I mentioned, but I felt at times like the Duke kind of got high on his own fumes there, a bit too bloated on his own success, and he just, I don't know, took too much spice. <laughs> That's how I would put it. He took too much spice and did this. The writing in itself, I don't mind. It even got a bit better, stylistically speaking. That's not what bothered me, so let's get on to the characters, I guess. Oof, you're gonna hear me say that a lot. This book is incredibly oof-inducing. The main character, the main star of the show, if you can call it that, is freaking God Emperor Leto II, Atreides, who's this ginormous weirworm, we're gonna call it that, a bit of human head with puny arms encased in the continually transforming body of a sandworm because, you know, he got enveloped by all these sand trouts by the end of Children of Dune and so he becomes this god, or what I would more aptly call monster, but then you could kind of have a reflection going on about what's the actual difference between a god and a monster, so I will give that to Frank Herbert. So he's the main character, he talks a lot, he explains shit, overstays his welcome by 3500 years. <laughs> I feel this is like the book that divides the Dune fandom, right? Some people, a lot of people apparently on the subreddit for Dune as I've noticed, love God Emperor of Dune. I understand that he's supposed to be a tragic character because he makes the ultimate sacrifice for his fucking golden path which you never really understand what the bloody hell it's supposed to be until apparently books five and six, but again that's another pet peeve of mine, I shouldn't have to wait for the bloody next book to get an explanation for the main plot arc of the book I'm reading. That's just bad storytelling. He makes the big sacrifice and he's all alone in the universe. There's no one else like me in the universe. I'm so sad. But you're still a bloody tyrant. You're still a bloody despot. And somehow it's supposed to make sense that to make sure humans never fall for despots and tyrants, you smush them into the ground under a despot slash tyrant for 3,500 years. What? <laughs> How does that make sense? Is it supposed to be some kind of sociological vaccination? But it wouldn't even work on that time scale. Human lives are too short for that to work on such a huge time scale. It makes no bloody sense. You're gonna disgust humans from despotism and authoritarianism by being the worst authoritarian that's ever lived and then you try to justify that to yourself. But then at times he clearly believes he's right in being a massive asshole. And I'm supposed to feel sorry for that? I'm supposed to feel sympathy for that monster? Fuck that. I'm sorry, no. Because, okay, maybe I've been swimming in this shit for a bit too long these past few months, but the way he talks sounds like an abuser would talk. Like someone who abuses another person psychologically or even sexually, like a predator. Well, he actually calls himself the ultimate predator, so I guess it kind of fits. He talks like an abuser, and he's justifying his abuse, not just on another person, but on the entirety of humankind. Just die already. Hopefully he does die at the end of the book, but like, no, no, I'm not gonna feel sympathy for you, mate. Screw you. You chose to get enveloped by sand trout. You chose to become this monster thing because of the golden path, whatever the fuck that's supposed to actually be. Sod off. And then you got, yeah sure, supporting characters I guess, Siona Trades, would be freaking do, like that's the other thing, plot wise basically nothing happens in this book besides conversations between Leto and a couple other characters. The span of the story is what, a couple of months at most? If even that? So you got Siona Trades, who's the rebel, but that never really goes anywhere because all of the 
descendants of his sister Ganima end up rebelling against him, but then he shows them supposedly this golden path, and so they're like, oh, I get it now, and I'm gonna be your ally. So you've got Maneo Atreides, who's like his great 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 grand nephew who's his major domo and he was a bit again wishy-washy with the characterization just highly forgettable he has a daughter called siona atreides and she's a rebel and she gets tested by leto and she kind of sees the golden path but she actually doesn't give a crap says it's not good enough mate and orchestrates his assassination thank you siona atreides thank you for your service to mankind. And then you've got Duncan Idaho. What a poor miserable bastard to get pseudo-resurrected ad nauseum by the freaking Tleilaxu in their freaking Gola tanks. I don't even really know what to make of him as a character because at the same time he's the same character that you get in the original Dune trilogy but not quite. See, okay, can we just talk about the massive plot hole here? How is he supposed to know Leto the second? The original Duncan Idaho dies in Dune. His body is recuperated by the Tleilaxu. They take his cells and clone him and do whatever they do in their axolotl tanks. They create the first Gola, who is also trained as a Mentat in Dune Messiah, and then Children of Dune, he becomes the consort of Aaliyah Atreides. That Duncan Idaho Gola knows of Leto II and Ganema, but then he dies. It's never made clear whether or not the Tleilaxu actually recouped that body to make their further Duncan Idaho Golas. From how I understood it, the Duncan Idaho they keep cloning is the original one who died in Doom, who should have zero memories of Leto II and Ganema. So, bruh, I'm gonna call you out on that, but that's a massive plot hole there, mate. And he's at the same time, like, the guy who serves to be the opposing voice to Leto II, but at the same time, he's very adolescent-like, and he's grossed out by the pseudo-lesbian behavior of the fish speakers, which are Leto's army and attendants. Okay, whatever, but at least he's like, I'm sick and tired of your tradies bullshit. I felt for you, mate, there, because I was sick of it too. And then you've got Hui Nari. Just why? Why? Why with the cringy ass romance elements? All that SF is known for not being good at sex, women, or romance. And see, I thought it was not that well done in the first Doom trilogy with like the romance between Paul and Chani. Or Cheney. I'm not sure he's supposed to pronounce that. But I thought he was actually alright overall and better than some of the stuff I'd seen. Oh boy, did we jump off that cliff again in God Emperor. Queen Ari, this like idealized version of the submissive woman, she magically falls in love with the big worm dude. How freaking convenient. And the big worm dude who's supposed to be above most of humanity and human concerns because he's losing his humanity. Yeah, after 3,500 years in a big worm body, I would assume that would mess with your head quite a bit. But somehow, magically, besides being this horrible tyrant despot that can see into the future and outmaneuver everyone around him, falls magically in love with Huinari. Oh, it was so bad. It was so, so, so freaking bad. I cannot emphasize how Ringy it was, oh my freaking god. But then, to make it just a wee bit more interesting, I guess, you throw in the pseudo love triangle element of future YA novels, with Duncan Idaho having the hots for Queen Ari, and Queen Ari having the hots for Duncan Idaho. And so they end up fucking that one time. And then, cherry on top of the shit cake, they have sex and Duncan Idaho, you've got this literal sentence, he said, oh, you're not a virgin. I just could I, my brain exploded. I just couldn't, it was just so bad. What's even more aggravating and offensive about it is that this was published in 1981. You would assume that the author would get better with time. 
this most definitely did not happen with Frank Herbert. And then there's this whole obsession with mating and breeding, but fine, okay, I'll allow it because it goes back to one of the major themes of the Doomverse, which is the ethics of controlled evolution, which I'll get to in my series review. And then the fish speakers, I couldn't with the fish speakers, who are all these female soldiers, attendants to the God Emperor, and they're obsessed with the God Emperor. They have the hots for him in a way, a sublimated way, I suppose. And you've got this weird ass episode where one of the fish speakers who's supposed to be a spy for Leto working with Siona and actually ends up helping Siona bump off Leto the second and she watches Duncan Idaho climb a cliffside and that gives her an orgasm. Again just just why? Why? And then another bloody plot point that just but I'll get back to that in my series review I feel <laughs> where Frank Herbert kind of blundered was actually with his pseudo heart sci-fi elements now I'm beginning to understand why some people classify this as science fantasy. The way he handles his harder sci-fi elements gets into fantasy territory in a way. I guess it wasn't good enough for him to stick to like softer sci-fi and by that I mean sci-fi that explores the softer branches of science like sociology, anthropology, psychology, brilliant examples of which you can find in feminist science fiction by the way. So I guess that wasn't good enough for him. He plays around with prescience and genetic ancestral memory but I'll develop that in my series review but so it is stated in the original Dune trilogy that if you're a pre-born or you've unlocked your genetic memory through spice, you get your ancestor's memory up until the point when the gamete which formed their descendant actually leaves their body. I'm probably saying that in a very convoluted way, I'm sorry if it's not terribly clear. So basically uh, if you have a father, you have your father's memories up until the point his sperm cell fused with your mother's egg cell to produce, well, yourself or one of your other ancestors. Yet, Lita II recalls experiencing the death of a lot of his ancestors. And that should not be possible by Frank Herbert's own world-building rules. Is it a major plot hole? I don't know, you be the judge of that, but that really bugged me. He was pushing too much into the direction of this is a godlike entity, upping his superpowers beyond what had previously been established as being possible, and that bugged me. It wasn't justified. The other thing is that I felt since the Golden Path is never actually explained in any kind of detail up until presumably Heretics of Dune, I felt like, you know that meme of the dog bonking things? with a bat. Well, I felt like this book was going like this. Golden Path, Golden Path, Golden Path. Have I told you how amazing the Golden Path is? Have I told you how justified all of the bullshit I'm doing is because of said Golden Path? Do you have the time for me to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, the Golden Path, without actually explaining what the Golden Path bloody is? And that got freaking annoying. Oh, yeah, I was like, just freaking tell me already what the Golden Path is. So I can care about what's going on, so I can actually feel a measure of empathy for Leto the second fucking Atreides. Because I didn't. Explain to me the logic of oppressing people for 3500 years in order for them never to fall under the spell of a despot. You cannot just apply the concept of vaccination to sociological phenomena that span thousands of years and it just does not work, okay? It doesn't. It just fundamentally does not work. I also think it fundamentally does not work when you try to make a sympathetic character out of something that is just profoundly inhuman while still trying to have it remain somewhat human. It's kind of like what I've said before about linguistic relativity in fiction. Most of the times I've encountered it, it didn't work because I don't think human beings experience language quite the way the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis presents it. Except when I read Embassy Town by China Miegel because he had it work like that with an alien species. And that worked brilliantly. And here it's like you're trying to make us feel sympathetic and understand something that is profoundly alien even though you're trying to convince us that he's still somewhat human. It does not work. Or at least I've never come across an iteration of that concept that works. Maybe there is one out there and I've yet to encounter it, but it definitely did not work 
in God Emperor of Doom. He's a monster. He's fundamentally a monster that somehow falls in love like a teenager with Queen Ari. Oh, oh, that was just so freaking bad. I can't get over how bad that was. Oh my god. And then quickly, elements of theming, I guess, or world building, whatever you want to call it. Like I said, this review is a bit all over the place. But for one thing, theming at this point, or at least in God Emperor of Dune, was largely redundant because it's just recycling what's been presented to you in the first Dune trilogy. And some of it contradicts what's presented in the Dune trilogy. It just makes these generalizations from anthropological concepts that just aren't supported by the evidence. But I will give a pass to that because he was writing presumably off of research he'd done when he was alive. And some of that research which has been dominated by a straight, largely white men, well, some of that has been amended, nuanced over the years, and obviously didn't have access to that, so fine. I'll give someone of a pass to that. But then there's the weird... Okay, I'll get back to this in my series review. I'll talk about feminism and Dune. Not in too much detail, but I will touch upon it. So it's kind of a recurring question of like, was Dune or the Dune verse feminist or anti-feminist? So okay, I can already tell you, I don't think it's either. It's again one of those situations where I don't think a work of fiction has to be feminist to be good or enjoyable or to bring interesting things to the table, to the conversation. Feminism doesn't have to be everything I consume. Not by long shot. So that's not a problem in and of itself in any case. But I would have well, I mean, I will say in my series of Ruby, you're getting a preview of that, that one thing that would have elevated it for me a bit would have been a conversation about gender dynamics in power and religion to really perfect that theming. And don't get me wrong, gender dynamics are absent from the Duneverse, but it really kind of gets problematic in God Emperor Dune, in my opinion, of course. All this is always my opinion, and you're free to disagree. That's what's great about what we're not really conversing, but think of it as a conversation and discussion. In God Emperor Dune, there are some weird gender, I mean, biologically based gender essentialist elements. As a feminist, I am not going to like that because as a feminist, I am against the oppressive structure of patriarchy. I am for equality between the sexes and one of the tools of oppression of what we call patriarchy is gender and assigning innate personality traits, desires, wants, attitudes, behaviors to the sexes. I am against that. I don't believe in that, etc etc. And there is some of that in God Emperor of Doom. So, sure, he has strong female characters. You've got the Benny Gesserit sisterhood, and I've read that apparently they get a lot more important in Heretics of Doom than Chapter House Doom. Fine, so I might change my mind along the way. But just because you got powerful female characters does not necessarily mean what you're doing is feminist or super progressive. I kind of touched upon this in my review of the Chronicles of Pern as well, because those gender essentialist elements were weird. So like the Emperor Leto has an exclusively female army of fish speakers who also serve as pseudo priestesses and things like that. But the way he justifies it felt so bloody off to me. They're more nurturing and I mean, <laughs> Not everything he says is trash bin worthy once again. Like, there are relevant comments on the fact that armies have used rape to subdue conquered populations over time, etc. So th that's true. But then these blanket statements on women are more nurturing, ergo an all-female army will never commit horrible acts of violence. <laughs> okay, no, not really. I mean, no. Even the explanation for why they're called fish speakers, that just came so out of left field because in my ancestral memories, I saw that the very first priestesses would communicate with the gods through fish. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Like, what? See, 
but there's lots of little moments like that where I'm like, just what? What is this? What am I reading? And it's, again, it's just so hyper-focused on reading and heterosexual dynamics. I like there's a reason for that thematically, but after a while, I'm starting to wonder, you got some not that progressive views on men and women, mate. I'm just gonna say it. Yeah, I don't actually think he was misogynistic, probably averagely sexist. So to me, it's not anti-feminist by any means. I'm not really that bothered, but it's definitely not feminist though. I've seen some people say, why hasn't the feminist movement adopted Dune? Why would we? We actually have female science fiction writers that we can look up to. We don't need do. The understandings of gender dynamics and feminist theory are extremely superficial from what I can tell. And now it gets into a bit more problematic territory. There are a couple paragraphs in there about homosexuality that are so, so just oof, mate. Now, apparently, from reading into it, I think Brian Herbert is gay and his dad had a real problem with that. I don't think what's in here is quite homophobic as such because it doesn't demonize homosexual behavior. But okay, just let me read you this passage and you can think whatever you want about it. But so, Maneo spoke in a soothing tone, but his words shook Idaho. I will tell you this only once. Homosexuals have been among the best warriors in our history. The berserkers of last resort. They were among our best priests and priestesses. Celibacy was no accident in religions. It is also no accident that adolescents make the best soldiers. Duncan Idaho replies, that's perversion, because he's really disgusted at the lesbian behavior he sees in some of the fish speakers, you understand. Quite right, Monea replied. Military commanders have known about the perverted displacement of sex into pain for thousands upon thousands of centuries. What the hell am I supposed to make of that? It's potentially offensive on so many different freaking levels. It's also stated that like it's normal for adolescents to engage in homosexual behavior, but then they grow out of it. Very Freudian, I might add. So thanks, but no thanks. Because I mean, what the fuck, mate? Like really? That's the weird thing too. He could have left it out of the book entirely. It doesn't add anything to the story or the plot. Just to show that Duncan Idaho is a bit prudish? Maybe? I mean, he could have not had homosexual representation, which would have been weird in like all female armies and, and stuff, but fine. A bit like Anne McCaffrey not addressing the weirdness of dragon riders who are exclusively male but engage in sexual activity, well, don't engage in sexual activity. There's something going there with that. It's very similar. He could have just not addressed it, which would have been a flaw in the world building and not realistic given the time span, etc. But it would have been better in a way than this? And what is that? They make good priests and soldiers. But then, see, this is what I find weird. So at the same time, male armies are dangerous because they rape civilians. True, historically speaking. But they're also a bunch of teenagers with repressed gay urges. So... Which is it? I read someone saying it's supposed to be commentary on the fact that the Greeks valued homosexual relationships between their soldiers to make them greater, more loyal elements on the battlefield. I think that's highly debatable because how you communicate that through that is a bit beyond me, to be honest. So yeah, that was just bad. So that in the weird gender essentialist elements just got on my nerves. Like I said, it doesn't have to be feminist, but this is getting into weird, definitely not progressive territory that I didn't enjoy. I kind of wonder, <laughs> this is going to sound very meta, was he trying to test his fandom with this? Like since the whole point of the first, well, one of the major points of the first Dune trilogy is not to trust charismatic leaders, messianic figures, etc. Was this his way of saying, don't worship me? I'm a flawed human being and 
and you hardcore fanboys need to calm down like my stuff isn't necessarily always going to be the one truth or the most brilliant works of literature ever and I'm not necessarily the genius you all thought I was I don't actually think that's what he thought consciously but it kind of works that way in this meta way of looking at the book or at least that's how I'm choosing to look at it to make it more digestible acceptable within the Dunamis. I don't freaking know at this point. Look, this book pissed me off. The one thing it had going for it is that I read through it very quickly. I don't know if it's because of the format, like it's a weirdly narrow paperback format. So I don't know, you just go through the dialogue super quickly, had no issue reading through it. But every so often I was like, how many pages do I have left? That's never a good sign. I wanted this to be over. And then so finally, good old Wormlito dies. The sand trout go back into the world and he dissolves. Or, I mean, there's very little of his human body remaining. The rest of it is a part sandworm. And so he dissolves in this gross puddle of spice essence and blood and bone going to mush. That'd be a great horror scene, like body horror wise, just seeing that on the screen. But speaking of screens, no way in hell do you make an adaptation of this. I've never said this about any book ever, that something is unadaptable for cinema or like TV. Some people have said this about the first Dune book. Some people have even said this about Annihilation. The Annihilation movie was to me a travesty and a garbage adaptation, but I, I think those books are adaptable. This might be the first book I've ever encountered where I actually genuinely think you cannot adapt this into a successful commercially viable movie or TV series. This would bore the crap out of people who, first off, might not have the intellectual inclinations a lot of SFF readers have, because it was bloody boring for someone like me. I do think I have a modicum of intelligence and a great appreciation for SFF literature and SFF theming. No way you're making this into a good adaptation. I don't see any, especially in this day and age of like, dumbing down media unfortunately, I don't see a chance in hell of a production studio touching this with a 10-foot pole. So yeah, that wraps up my thoughts about God Emperor of Doom. Wow, it was bad. Okay, I might just be exaggerating a wee bit. It is a rant review. Mind you, I still think it kind of sits at a 5 out of 10 or 4.5. Maybe a 5 because because, I mean, it's interesting to see the story unfold throughout the ages, I guess. You still have interesting philosophical threads of conversation, even though they are a bit redundant by the time of God Emperor of Doom. I still wrote down some quotes from it. It still made me think in a very uh, rage-fueled way, but still it made me think. Another quick, though, quibble I had with this book world building wise even though leto is the god emperor of the known universe or the known colonized universe what have you how is it that everything is so freaking homogenous it's unbelievable in a way and it's also a complaint i have for the chronicles of pern once again interesting the parallels i'm seeing here right now between the lack and quality of these two works of literature. I don't care that it has his armies of fish speakers or slash priestesses. Society is largely described as being homogenous across the colonized planets of humankind. You've got exceptions like the Ixians and the Tleilaxu. Fine. But the Bene Gesserit remark upon the fact that the way families function is basically the same everywhere. It's the nuclear family. There are no matrilineal societies, there are no tribal societies, there are no multiple marriages. Everything is the same. Even if he's like a prescient woman dude thing, how is he enforcing this over 3,500 years? Think about that for a minute. Think about how our human history has changed over 3,500 years. Whatever, I'm done with this now. So yeah, it's about a 5 out of 10, if I'm feeling generous. It's not complete garbage, but coming from the original Dune trilogy, holy crap, holy crap, did it jump the shark. Jump the sandworm, as it were. But I will go on with Heretics of Dune and then Chapter House Dune because I want to finish the series and I want to do a series review whenever that will be. I'm lagging a bit. I haven't picked up Heretics of Dune yet. I'm feeling I'm feeling burnt out a tad by God Emperor of Dune, but that's too bad. 
uh, also just another little bit of what the fuckery, just for sheer entertainment value. This is an actual sentence in this book. If someone can actually explain what the hell that was supposed to be to me, I'd highly appreciate it. So, um, she turned at a sound from the guest house. Moneo returns, she said, please, love. She calls a big, 10 meters long sandworm, human, love, short, whatever. Do not frighten him. Is Moneo your friend too? We are friends of the stomach. We both like yogurt. So that concludes my review, if you want to call it that, of God Emperor of Dune. A vlog? It's not really a vlog either. Vloggy review? Whatever. I don't know. Like I said, I'm tired. I hope you had some fun out of it because I actually like rock reviews. They usually make me laugh and amuse me. So perhaps it might amuse you. Who knows? Stranger things have happened, right? And like I said, pretend that time does not exist in these videos. Because by the time you watch this, I might not actually be here anymore. And not be here for like a month. So uh, on that note, did you like it? Are you one of those who thinks this is a work of pure brilliance? Or are you one of those who thinks this is the weakest of the Doom books? I'm curious to see your poll on that, actually. Maybe there is one on like r slash science fiction, fancy, Doom whatever. In the meantime, I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening, whichever time of day you prefer. Take good care of yourselves, and I shall see you in the next video, whenever that might be. Until then, bye!